going to take you now back inside the policy conference. Sandy Bruja is on the stage and he's getting ready to introduce Mitch Daniels for his keynote speech, the former governor of Indiana. Go ahead, take a look. Following to good effect. Now, you all have heard and seen leaders and politicians over the year who talk a good game about being fiscally responsible. Those of us who have been privileged to know Governor Daniels over the years, we all have a Mitch fiscal responsibility story. And let me tell you mine. So it was about 2006, he was the governor of Indiana. I was representing the president and we were dedicating a very unique automotive plant in Lafayette, Indiana, where they were making Subarus and Toyotas, Toyota Camrys in particular. And this ceremony was to celebrate the addition of the Toyota Camry to this zero landfill plant in Lafayette. And so after the speeches were done and the ribbons had been cut, the first Camry that rolls off the line is driven by a Toyota executive. Governor Daniels is in the front seat. I'm like the little kid being the backseat driver in the back. And the Toyota executive is describing all the features of this Toyota Camry, kind of like a little Vanna moment. And the governor pauses and looks around for a bit and says, so air conditioning, does it have to come with air conditioning or can I get it without it? And I said, well, no, they mostly come with air conditioning. Uh, what about these power windows? Do I have to take the power windows with it? Because I, you know, I, I, well, I just crank my own windows. And I said, well, no, they, pretty much they all come with, 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 with power windows. Okay, well, you know, what about this feature? What about this feature? And I'm sitting in the back seat and I'm thinking, wow, this guy's an amazing leader, but I will not buy a used car from this guy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have been trying to get him here for years. Please welcome one of America's great leaders, someone who we're so proud to have on this stage this year at the Mackinac Policy Conference, the Honorable Mitch Daniels. <laughs> Well, I want to thank my good friend Sandy for bringing back a memory that had eluded me. Uh, my, my wife could relate to it, I know. If she were here, she'd be nodding to it. Thanks to all of you for an opportunity I've been looking forward to and, and uh, we'll hope to do uh, justice to. It's great to be here 40, maybe 40 years ago as a young person, the only chance I ever had to visit this facility. And, and it's a treat to be back in Michigan anywhere, but particularly here. It's a lot safer for me, honestly, than uh, Illinois, <laughs> which is, I get a lot of, I have a lot of business there and a lot of time, occasions to go there, and I always have to watch my mouth on those occasions because uh, uh, Illinois' well-known uh, uh, travails uh, come up, and we're in immediate proximity, of course, to them, and people are always drawing contrasts. And, uh, uh, so I've, I've occasionally gotten myself in trouble. I was on their big radio show in Chicago a few years ago, and they just had some other, I guess, fiscal catastrophe, and the uh, hosts were baiting me and said, well, you know, all this Indiana doing very, very well, Illinois, the shape we're in, you know, um, uh, how's it look from right next door? And it's live radio, you know, you got to say something off the cuff. I said... Oh, I said, it's like living next door to the Simpsons. <laughs> you know, there's a dysfunctional family on the block, and they're right there. <laughs> One time I was up there to give a talk. It was sort of like a, a nice occasion, sort of like this, similar size crowd. And um, it happened to be the day of the Olympics decision. And uh, the town was electric. We hit town, and I mean, there were bandstands and balloons. Everybody's wearing matching T-shirts, you know, and we're, we're going to win. And uh, um, we were for them. Um, we'd send a letter or something. I thought, you know, we'll get a, maybe we'll get a field hockey game or something on our side of the line. <laughs> and uh, so I give the talk, and then as we'll do here in a little bit, there's a Q&A session. Some guy got up, and why he asked me, I don't know, but he says, oh, I skipped the important part. 
In the middle of the morning, the shocking news comes, they're not selected. In fact, uh, they don't even get out of the first round. Eventually, Rio gets picked. So the guy gets up and says, ask my reaction to the Olympics decision. Again, you know, I didn't see this question coming. And I said, well, what is this world coming to when Chicago can't fix an election anymore? <laughs> I thought it was funny, and <laughs> the audience definitely did. The, you know, Newsweek magazine did. They put it in their next edition. The governor of Illinois did not find the humor in it and <laughs> said so. So anyway, I feel on much safer ground here because uh, I, what I see what, what you folks are uh, doing and accomplishing is, is, is very positive and encouraging. Um, as, as Sandy pointed out, I've led uh, more than one life, and here I am in a brand new one again, and, and it, uh, uh, no one was more surprised than I, unless it was the, the uh, wife of a good friend of mine in New York. She's a very cosmopolitan lady, been a huge figure in the publishing business, knows everybody you've heard of. Uh, celebrities and so forth, and he goes home that uh, the day of the announcement and says, did you hear about Mitch? No, what? He's going to be president of Purdue. She said, that is just terrible. He said, uh, well, no, I think it's kind of cool. What's the matter with it? She said, his talents will be totally wasted in the chicken business. <laughs> so I'm wearing my <laughs> colors today. I obviously, we obviously have a little bit of marketing at least in New York City to do. Um, yeah, people are always asking me. It's happened here two or three times already. People said, uh, oh, you know, gee, I mean, business to government, government to higher ed, you know, what's the difference? And I usually say, oh, in my last job, it was dog eat dog, but now it's just the opposite. <laughs> um, I have had, I'm, I'm trying to learn a new sense of humor. I mean college campuses, intellectuals. I mean, they, it's just a little different way of thinking they have. You know, th their idea of jokes are things like, uh, entropy ain't what it used to be. <laughs> we just separated the engineers from the liberal arts major. <laughs> or, uh, oh, uh, a guy walks in a bar and says, I'd like a very dry martinis. Bartender says, you mean a martini? He says, if I wanted a double, I'd have asked for one. You know. <laughs> so, so um, I had some good input, but, but of, of, uh, of different, uh, of different uh, kinds about uh, what you might like to hear about. I hope I'll come near the mark. And then my friend Devin and I will have a conversation. I'm sure that'll at least uh, 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 prove useful of whether this does or not. Let me just, in my last uh, life, the disclaimers uh, usually came at the end of the message. I'm going to give two or three at the beginning of this one. Uh, first is that I am not here to prescribe anything. Uh, I, I think I learned a lot in um, the job of governor and in, and in uh, some other public service that I uh, was asked to do. But no two states are alike. And uh, I wouldn't presume for a minute to say that I know what the right choices are, the right steps uh, forward for your great state. Um, I will say that, I mean, there are, some, there are some obvious differences as I have always seen it. To tell the truth, until not that long ago, I think most people where I live, most people elsewhere, thought of Michigan as a vanguard state, as a progressive state, as a state that often led and innovated. Um, I think some of the bloom has been off that rose, and now you're recovering it. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Indiana, on the other hand, clearly throughout its history has been a change averse state, rarely if ever known for initiative and innovation and so forth. This was something that motivated those of us who came together now a decade ago, try to make something different happen. And we fought it every day, and we preached it every day, and that, that um, uh, we had to, uh, you either had to, uh, uh, change or sink back, that uh, if you uh, tread water in this rural, I used to say, you will sink. Um, so we had that to work to wrestle with, not a tradition of leadership. Um, I hope we've started this to establish one. On the other hand, we did not have, as some other states have, huge millstones. We didn't have uh, a particularly tough pension 
public pension problem. Uh, ours was much more modest, and we got it as well fixed as any state in the country now. Uh, we didn't have a problem like the one you have with Detroit. So um, situations different, have to always remember that. Second, you want to make big, big change, really change the trajectory or the whole course of, uh, some, uh, of a place the size of your state or ours. Uh, there's nothing, e it's never going to be easy, it's not going to be fast. Now, converse is not true. It, I used to tell our folks, it takes a long, long time to build a great state, you can tear it down pretty fast. And we've seen examples of that. Um, you know, it took a lot of ingenuity to wreck California the way those folks have, but they, have, they about pulled it off. Last disclaimer, there's no way to hide, nowhere to hide from the national overhang. And I'll come back to this at the end, but um, the, 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 the greatest leadership, government, business, civic, that can be assembled in a state um, is of a limited avail if the nation is struggling, particularly its economy. And an economy gimping along at less than 2% year on year on year um, is simply not going to create the potential for even the best leadership to, to succeed. And uh, so all that said, uh, great things are possible, always. And um, I guess what I would like to talk about for a few minutes today is how important it is to try to find uh, vocabulary, uh, specific proposals, a style of politics that gathers people together uh, at a time at which we suffer from a very discouraging and in some respects I think dangerous division across American society. I mean, we've got big, big work to do in any state I know and certainly as a nation and big change requires big majorities. This is the last time we need to be as fractured as we have been lately. We, we've seen far too much scapegoating. We've seen a plummet of public confidence in institutions from the presidency on down. And uh, uh, ultimately, this is uh, very uh, corrosive, both of our, op of our opportunities to move forward and of the social uh, fabric, which has always held this beautifully uh, diverse country together. Now, my sense is that public leadership uh, starts with some very, very basic uh, down payments. The first is, uh, is honesty. Uh, the, the first thing w we did, among many first things on, on arrival, was to rewrite by executive order and then as fast as we could in statute all the ethics laws of Indiana, make them as, as pristine, as uh, unimpeachable, as unequivocal, as tough as any we could find anywhere. A zero tolerance attitude, mercifully in eight years, very few people, even at low, low levels, ever tried to color outside the line, but we took a, an attitude of uh, absolutism about it. The public needs to know that uh, those people entrusted with its, uh, with its money and, and with public responsibilities are in it for only the uh, highest of uh, motives. Second is simple competence. And I say simple, but you know, this is a really a paradoxical thing to me. If there's anything that people who differ honestly about other subjects ought to agree on, it is that uh, government has a solemn duty to perform well. But uh, how rarely this is, a sub, this is an area of genuine focus and concentration. So some people who believe in very limited government think the job is done when they've trimmed it some or, or, or limited it and confined it in some way. Um, others who believe in a, in a more active, more uh, involved and expansive government um, think their job is done when they've gotten more money for whatever it is and are very uninterested in whether that money is well spent, whether we get real results for the government we have. And one thing we ought to agree on is whether I may believe the government should be careful not to get outside uh, a, a certain sphere of activity, and you may believe in a much larger sphere. But whatever it does, it, it ought to do very, very well. Um, I used to tell people, you know, you'd be amazed how much government you'll never miss. Um, but 
even if you're one of those people who might miss more than I would, um, we ought to share a commitment to do things right. So in Indiana, we, I could bore you all afternoon with uh, sort of worst to first stories, but things as, as fundamental as child welfare, we literally went from the worst on the penalty, in the penalty box of the federal government for good reason to winning national awards. It, had to, it, it takes a relentless and almost tedious commitment to measurement and to uh, something I'll get to in a minute, which is, which is a, a ability to reward people for good performance. But uh, um, many people misconstrued some of the actions we took. They noticed that sometimes we decided to work with the private sector to deliver an effect, an, a, a necessary and important public service. And they thought it was something theological, you know, talking about privatization. I never once used that word, the P word. Um, I said the only P word we use is pragmatic. If a given service should be delivered, that's question one. If it really should be, uh, it's a, if it's a proper expenditure of a dollar we took from a free citizen in taxation, then uh, the next question is, what's the best way to do it? And uh, sometimes that led us to add to the government we had, like child welfare workers or state police. Um, uh, sometimes it led us to hire somebody who did something for a living all day, every day. I used to say to people, if it's in the yellow pages, maybe somebody can do it better than we do. And I hadn't been in office a month, and I got a call from this bright young guy who turned our whole corrections department into one of the best in America. And he said, you know you're paying $1.43 a meal for food? I said, well, no, is that a lot? He said, yeah, it's a lot. He said, the last day, I, I worked in another state, it was 98 cents, uh, or 95 cents, and I think the food was better. He said, but we hired, you know, people, and do you mind if I look around? I said, no, go see what you can do. He comes back after a rather swift process, hired some uh, well-known firm, uh, probably feeds you at the football stadium here or somewhere like that, and I think it was 98 cents, so something like that. 45 cents times 22,000 inmates times three squares a day times 365 days a year. I know you're doing the mental math as I do this. Uh, it came out to you know 14 or 15 million a year, just like that, with higher standards for nutrition and and uh, quality and so forth. So, the example of competence that every Hoosier will remember when they can't remember who the heck was governor recently is our Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Now, I don't know a state that doesn't hate theirs, and, but I guarantee you, almost there couldn't be any place that was much worse than Indiana. Uh, till a few years ago. I used to say people go to the Indiana license branch with a box lunch and a copy of War and Peace <laughs> and hope they don't finish them both <laughs> before somebody notices they're there. Um, I'm going to skip a story which has now been commemorated in a, in a business school case because it was seen as such an incredible business turnaround. But at, at the end of the day, uh, if you leave an Indian, if you even have to go to an Indiana license branch today, which you will not have to do 70 or 80 percent of the time unless you really want to, you can make an appointment, by the way, if you go one, or you can go online and see where the lines are shortest, but they're all short. You will be out on average in nine minutes and a half, and 98 percent of the time you will be satisfied. And uh, why, was, why were we so fixed on that one? Because it's the one that every citizen visits. And every citizen encounters. There are only so many of those. Department of Revenue, you know. Um, but this one in particular. And I was determined that we would do whatever it took to make that thing work right because public confidence is important. These three things I have, uh, the, there are three things. The third being just pay your bills. Don't go broke. Pretty simple. If, you're, uh, if you display honesty and a total commitment to integrity, if you are very serious about delivering basic public service as well, and you are careful about the public's money, that's the price of admission. That's the, um, the, the, the entry price, seems to me, for asking the public to join you and join together in doing big things, the kind you're trying to do up here, the kind we were intent on doing in, in Indiana. Um, in, uh, in our last year, 2012, 
um, a, a, a university somewhere took a survey across the country, see, and one of the questions was how uh, um, much confidence do you have in the quality of your state government? It was, Indiana number was 77%, only, second only to Montana. And I don't even know what they need government for in Montana, so. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, now, it, it, it's, it doesn't happen just as an act of the will. You have, to, we had to, you have to put some things in place. We did. And I was able to do this by, uh, undo it, I should say, by executive order. We did make unionism in public and state public employment voluntary. Incidentally, within eight months, 92% had voluntarily stopped paying the dues. But that's not the real point. The point of doing that was, had nothing to do with unions per se, and it wasn't really to save money, although indirectly we wound up saving boatloads of money. What it was about was 160 pages of do's and don'ts that basically said you couldn't pick up this laser and you know, move it over here without a 60-day, 90-day consultation with somebody or other. You couldn't combine departments, you couldn't divide departments, you couldn't reassign people. Now, you couldn't get rid of people who weren't uh, upholding the public trust. And um, uh, one year later, we put in place what, as far as I know, is the only system still of true performance pay across Indiana state government. So this won't seem strange to most people in this room, but in government, it's very strange that the uh, best performers get paid a whole lot more, paid on a bell curve, those at the bottom end, get a second chance and on probation or out. And uh, eight years later, I think we have a culture of performance there that's important. So all these three things, I think, are just basic, again, down payments. The point of government is not, uh, and, I, and I thank Sandy for making this point, the point of government is not really to control spending and balance budget and so forth. That's a, that's a matter of as far as I'm concerned, a basic responsibility. But what we're trying to do is build in our state, in your state, I hope as a nation, constantly build that, that place of opportunity and promise that, that uh, leads to individual accomplishment and to collective success as a nation. So how do you do the really big things if you've made the down payment, if people are willing to listen, at least, to ideas for big change? Um, you know the old saying, I've been rich, I've been poor, and rich is better. Well, I've operated with a friendly legislature and a divided legislature, and I can tell you which is better. But, uh, you know, Churchill said the only thing worse than fighting a war with allies is fighting one without <laughs> allies, and I know what he means now. Um, but let me just give you a couple quick examples, there were times, even with divided government, where we were able to make big things happen. Sometimes it was because there was a genuine alignment of interests. So when we decided to uh, deregulate telecommunications more than any state in the country, one-stop shop, quick in, free competition, quick uh, access to market, no longer had to go around kiss rings, community by community, all that thing. Uh, the Communication Workers of America and many other people saw the advantage in this. And um, we were able to ac actually, it was one of those rare occasions of a genuine uh, uh, consensus and coalition across typical lines. When we advanced an idea for, the health, for health insurance for the uninsured, those who are above the Medicaid line, uh, we came with an approach that's very, very different than Medicaid, very different than what our loyal opposition would have preferred the way to do it, but the goal was one they shared and had talked about, to their credit, for a long, long time. And so we had agreement on philosophy and agreement on ends, and they finally had to come along with our way of doing it, which was, loosely speaking, more consumerist and more individually uh, driven. Another example is in 2008, we. Uh, decided that the biggest problem in taxation in Indiana was property taxes, which were uh, too high, or at least, and too unpredictable, and, and that we were a little too lopsided in the composition of our revenue. So um, 
we went for that. In that case, our opponents really didn't like what we wanted to do, probably disliked it intensely. But they didn't want to get in the way of, of, a, of a public which had united around the issue. And we made certain, despite knowing their private views, to cut them in on the credit. They were right there. Um, they weren't smiling much, but they were right there at the signing ceremony as I thanked them for their indispensable help. Um, now, you know, all this, uh, all this uh, attitude of amity and comedy and, and uh, trying to get people together has its limits, of course. And politics, of course, can get in the way even of a shared goal and a good idea. So here I'll give you the example of infrastructure. It's not hard for me, and I've already mentioned some, to list, uh, list the areas in which this divided nation of ours ought to find agreement. Well, one of them is certainly public infrastructure. Um, again, regardless of your view of economics, regardless of your view of the size or shape of government, having first-rate infrastructure um, to enable business and enterprise to, to thrive and be more efficient surely is a responsibility of government. As always, how you do it is open to debate. We got very fortunate in Indiana, saw an opportunity and seized it. Um, in 2006, the markets were right, the climate seemed right. Uh, we had a huge infrastructure gap. I don't know a state that doesn't. And um, having looked at, as I recall, 31 options, the only one that had a prayer of generating the necessary billions was to see if anyone wanted to lease our toll road. We had an existing toll road that was losing money as a patronage operation. And uh, um, so we went out to see. We got, again, we hit the mother load. The time was right. Uh, got an enormous bid and took it to a legislature, which in my naivete, I thought would rush together to embrace this. Here's four billion free dollars cash we could build projects all over the state that people had literally dreamed of and been promised for decades that we didn't have a prayer of building or rebuilding. And, um, but because um, the winning bidder included some international investors, um, some folks saw a political opening and turned into what should have been a consensus love-in turned into a Donnybrook. I got to stop and tell you a couple quick stories about this deal. Uh, which is still written up all over the place. So I got interested in this, driving relentlessly the states of in, state of Indiana, no name, first time candidate. Uh, toll road, last booth before Chicago, 15 cents, like one five. Um, and you know, that's a problem these days, like who's got a nickel, right? <laughs> so, I, so I get elected and I, and th this is before I hit on the idea of the lease, but I said this toll road, of ours, I said, what's with that 15 cent? How much does it cost us to collect the toll? Well, it's government, they don't know. So I said, well, <laughs> I said, go figure it out. They come back in a couple weeks, they go, we think it's 34 cents. I said, great business model. I said, I, I got a better one. You know, fire the patronage worker, close the toll booth, put out a goldfish bowl, right, a cigar box. <laughs> we'll go to the honor system. And we're 19 cents ahead, and you know, occasionally some nice person will chuck in a quarter, you know, just to be just to be a good citizen. So that's when I first got the idea, you know, maybe there's some trap value here. And we, so anyway, uh, we we do it, and I just have this to say to the business people in the room. Uh, remember, we so and we we have, we value the the road, assuming that every future governor. Um, would be different than every preceding governor, meaning they would have the nerve to raise the tolls just in line with inflation. Not, you say, why was the thing losing money? Well, because they hadn't raised the tolls in 25 years, because somebody might get upset. So um, anyway, we valued the road at maybe a billion three. If you pushed it, you could maybe get it up in the high ones. Uh, the bid was about $4 billion, plus huge investments in the road itself. It's better than it's ever been. So I tell all my business friends, look, anybody ever walks in your office and says, I'd like to offer you 61 times EBITDA for this business. Like, don't say, I'll, let me sleep on it. 
right? Don't even call the board. They're going to forget, you know? Before the guy comes to his senses, sign. And, uh, uh, but um, I'll tell you what, he was like walking on coals it, 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 it's to, get, to get this thing done. But we saw it through. Thank goodness we acted when we did. Lots of counsel. Oh, maybe we ought to wait. Let's, have a st let's study it for a year. The deal would never have happened. You know, basic principle, I think I've talked to your governor about this before, is if you've got a good idea, um, move, it move fast. There's a country song title I like, if I'd shot you when I should have, I'd be out of jail by now. <laughs> so, you know, like, you know, shoot now, you know, serve the sentence and, and the results, the, the results will, will, is what matters, right, in the end anyway. You know, Abe Lincoln said, some, some stumps you can dig up, some stumps you have to blast out, some stumps you just have to plow around. So we plowed around stumps on a lot of those issues and others, always trying, not always successful, always trying to see if we could get people together so that the changes have staying power. If, if, if somebody on the other side, maybe not everybody, but if some folks do, they have some investment in, in uh, not undoing that the first uh, chance they get. And, um, but there were a lot of other things that had to await uh, the, the uh, dynamiting of, of that particular stump, things like sweeping education reform and unemployment insurance reform, making permanent the civil service changes that I talked about, and, uh, and of course, right to work. But all I have to say to you, just from that quick little summary, is that if Indiana, as, as, as risk-averse, change-averse, conservative in the cultural sense of let somebody else try it first, if, if we can make big changes, then Michigan, with your proud history, certainly can too. So let me wrap up with a few thoughts um, that are a little broader. You know, the consensus, the this, this single consensus we need most, I believe in this country, and I hope one day we'll achieve it, is that uh, uh, is around the issue of a, of a private economy that grows much faster and doing all those things one can do to make this happen. Again, whatever size government, people, honest people can differ so widely on this and that's fine, but whatever size government you think is appropriate and necessary, we are never gonna deliver it with an economy staggering along at 1.x percent. Uh, it just won't cut it and it, in fact, Ironically, those who favor a, a big and a very active and expensive government has a, have a deeper stake in a faster growing economy because the, otherwise the revenues cannot possibly be there. Um, I want to speak specifically on behalf of the young people on the Purdue campus and on President Simon's campus and on President uh, uh, Coleman's campus and Roy's and everywhere else, and all those who aren't on a campus at all. Um, uh, the debt we are about to dump on the next generation is an economic problem. It will stunt growth over the long term, clearly. It is a huge fiscal problem. It is squeezing the life out of necessary government programs, including higher education. And, uh, but it's a moral problem. It is, a re it is an indefensible position morally to borrow money in gigantic quantities and spend it not to invest on roads and bridges and the kinds of things that I, our, our major moves program did in Indiana, but to spend it on consumption today and to spend it on the last generation at the ultimate and inevitable expense of the next generation. And um, we cannot tackle that at 2% year-on-year growth in this economy at least as large a question, is what a prolonged period of economic stagnation will do to social cohesion in this country, to that sense of, up, of opportunity and promise and upward mobility that's been, what, it's been what brought people to this nation and has kept us together as a nation that's not bound by any other tie of ethnicity or religion or anything else. You know, we've got fewer people participating in the workforce now than, since, than we did since the days of the stay-at-home mom. And why aren't they there? They're giving up. It's unacceptable. And it's not just displaced older workers. The unemployment rate, as you know, among those under 30 is as high as it's been in forever. 
Uh, we've got high percentages living at home, and uh, we've got high percentages uh, of people who have been to college uh, in occupations that really don't require a college degree. And so uh, I hope that people who we can disagree later about how to spend the money. First, let's generate some for government. Let's pay our debts, or at least stop in, uh, in, incurring them at a staggering, mathematically unsustainable rate. Um, someone reminded me at the reception before. Um, I, uh, when, when I was first elected, before we even took office, we were all new. Our, our team had been out, so our team, so to speak, had been out for um, 16 years. And uh, so everybody was, we were all rookies. But we were in a hotel room, not much, a little bit smaller than this one. The first, I don't know, 80 or 85 suckers who'd agreed to come on this adventure with us. And I said to them, I remember saying to them, I said, listen, every great enterprise I ever saw, uh, pu private, public, or nonprofit, had a very clear purpose. Um, it was, uh, it was on the uh, wall or the annual report or the laminated ID card. It was, they could, I don't know, it's their mission, their vision, you know, and whatever buzzword you prefer. I said, but anyway, it was a clear statement of what they were there for. And everybody knew what it was. And everybody knew, and every unit knew, what their role was in trying to produce that outcome. And if they had their act together, they were being measured to see if they were delivering or not. And... Uh, you know, I, I used to do a lot of business with Walmart, and they used to say down there, if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. So we measured everything. Well, I said, okay, um, here's ours. We are here to raise the net disposable income of Hoosiers. That's it. I don't know if we're here for four years or eight years, but every day we're here, that's what we're working on. If we do that, uh, if, if, if we have more jobs, if the jobs over time pay more than the jobs of today on average, um, if we find ways to leave a few more of those earned dollars in the pockets of those who worked for them, things will start to take, other problems start to get smaller. We'll have the revenue for great schools and roads and parks and, and universities and everything we want. And, uh, and we'll, have a, we'll have a place that people want to move into, not move out of because they see the opportunity there. So I said, that's it. So I don't care where you're working. Don't think there's any place here where we can't find a way that you can contribute. Maybe it's uh, how long it takes to turn around a permit. Um, maybe it's uh, how fast somebody gets their tax return back and gets the cash back in their own hands. Um, maybe it's how few minutes they spend in the license branch when they could be out doing something productive. Whatever it is, we're going to figure it out. And we're gonna, what, what you can either do or do better, or do faster, or maybe stop doing, that makes it more likely that next job comes to Indiana, not Illinois, not Michigan, not California. And when it gets here, it pays a little better and all the rest of that. Now, I only tell you that because I really hope that our nation will make a similar focused commitment to break all the ties and call all the close ones until further notice in favor of growing the private economy from which all good things must ultimately come. Uh, that doesn't mean other priorities aren't important. Of course they are. But nothing should displace that. All close ones should be called in favor of growth. To take the most obvious example, um, you revere your environment up here, you do a wonderful job of protecting it. But poor states, poor nations are never green. Green is expensive. And we're gonna have to, we're gonna have, to have, we have to generate the wealth to pay for it. And uh, similarly with other very important, you don't cast these other priorities aside, but you, you do not let them, uh, if you really care about poor people, and you really care about keeping a middle class, and you really care about young people having the same sense of potential and opportunity in life that most of us were lucky enough to have, then it, other things are gonna have to take a close second place for a while. And especially if we hope to pay those bills that we've all run up. So on behalf of uh, the students on our campus, but really young people across our state, Michigan and everywhere, I hope this is, makes some sense to you and that you'll be 
the, the important voices in this room will be heard on those subjects. Uh, I will say it's, it's really, it's great to see what at least I think I see, which is Michigan resuming a lot of uh, uh, forward progress and, uh, and uh, innovative ideas and the kind of leadership we've always as, as, uh, have uh, associated with you. Um, seeing uh, Michigan back to leadership is a great thing for us all. Thank you for having me. Please welcome the anchor of WDIV TV4 NBC, Devin Skillian. Right here's good. Yeah. Uh, unless you'd rather move further from me, uh, that's no, fine. No, you don't look too dangerous. <laughs> no. uh, I, I, uh, it's interesting, nobody has yet mentioned the towering achievement of Mitch Daniels' career. I mentioned to the governor earlier that both of my parents are originally from Evansville, Indiana, so I spent a lot of time uh, in southern Indiana as a youngster. It was 2005, put that one, 2005, that Governor Daniels was able to get Indiana to accept daylight savings time. <laughs> you have no idea, right? You have no idea. <laughs> Don't, let's don't even talk about it. <laughs> There's a book in there. If but you were just driving through Indiana forever, it didn't matter what time you thought it was, you were wrong. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to, I, 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 you and I are going to talk mostly about higher ed, uh, but before I do that, I thought it, you, you slid an interesting comment in there earlier in your remarks about uh, it took a lot of ingenuity to wreck California. I'm curious as to where you think the fault line is, fault line's a bad <laughs> word to use mm -hmm. for California, sorry. The, uh, but where is that tripwire between making a decision that puts a state on the right footing and one that puts you past the point of rescue. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I have basically the same newspaper knowledge of California that everybody in the room does, but uh, clearly, uh, in my judgment, um, we made a serious mistake as a nation when we veered into public sector unionism uh, to the extent we did. And California clearly is a, is a graphic example of this. You have, you know, the famous, um, you know, lifeguards retiring in their forties with literally, you know, quarter million, $300,000 pensions, that sort of thing. Um, double dipping, triple dipping, huge costs. Locked in, locked in even constitutionally, I think, anyway, locked in mm -hmm. uh, so that other priorities, things that for younger people can't be funded, uh, what's happening to their universities out there. I don't know about Michigan, Michigan State, I bet you got it too. We're flooded with Californians at Purdue. I mean, part of it is a strong tradition in engineering and in the STEM disciplines that, uh, but a lot of it is, uh, when I visit with these students, a lot of it is, you know, their, their own once enormously proud systems in terrible shape yeah. out there. So, uh, you know, I think that that that's that's one area. Illinois, I think, is struggling for much the same reason. And uh, you know, to, uh, FDR didn't think uh, public sector unionism was appropriate. George Meany didn't think it. Fiorello LaGuardia didn't think it. Uh, but uh, we we wound up there, and uh, within its limits, uh, if it had been kept within limits, I think that. Um, it could have been fine. As I said, the biggest issue we faced in, in our state was not that a pension system or compensation had, 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 been, uh, had run beyond um, reasonable bounds. It was, though, but it was work rules and the inability really mm -hmm. to make things work well for citizens. And so I think that's one. Yeah. I, I wouldn't assign all their trouble to that. They have a very anti-growth mentality out there. And gosh, I'm, you know, who, it, I don't know anybody who's not for being careful about development and, uh, and investment. And, and uh, certainly with, they have a lot of beautiful spaces to protect. But if you just talk to anybody out there, it's, um, it's as though they, you know, you, people say things like, they act like they're doing us a favor um, they're doing us a favor uh, to let us hire somebody. Yeah, yeah, tricky. Well, let's move to, to higher education if we yeah. could. I'm curious as to how your transition has been to higher ed because I remember when Lawrence Summers took over at Harvard after getting used to work, working in the government and having what he had uh, developed as a certain sense of autonomy and authority, he got to Harvard and said he realized he was the least powerful guy mm -hmm. on campus. <laughs> uh, what's been your experience with uh, going from 
being a governor with a certain amount, a clear amount of autonomy to now the university setting? It's different, of course, but um, by, I think by a lesser degree than some people think. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's not just uh, people, the, the term in higher ed, shared governance, um, I don't know anywhere really where governance isn't shared anymore. It's just a question of, uh, of uh, to what extent. Uh, I just got done illustrating all kinds of ways in yep. which, right. for the most fundamental of reasons, governance is broadly shared in the, in the public sector of this country, even in business. Um, uh, I, I certainly learned um, that uh, if you really want things done well, you've got to get people enthusiastically and voluntarily aligned with those goals, the kind of goals I mentioned. So I find it entirely appropriate. Now, you have to, uh, higher ed is, uh, in my judgment, is a very fascinating place to be right now because uh, people are asking questions and raising challenges that we've never heard before. Are too yeah. many kids going to school? Are they learning anything real while they're there? Um, you know, how do I know what a degree's worth? Um, and, you got uh, an answer for that yet? And of well, we're working on it. You had my, my new friend Jim Clifton was here at this meeting. Yep, yesterday. Very interesting guy leading a great organization. And, and uh, we recently released something called the Gallup-Purdue Index, which is the biggest, uh, most rigorous piece of research ever done on the uh, multidimensional well-being and success of college graduates. So we now have data we've never had before, public versus private, regional, uh, uh, for-profit versus non-profit, small schools versus big schools, all this. Um, not just how well folks are doing, uh, people are doing financially, but also in terms of health status, in terms of their engagement with work and community and uh, uh, all the, uh, as Gallup calls them, domains of well-being. So part of it is being willing to prove that the uh, output of your work is, is of, of high quality, as we suspect. Uh, I look forward to knowing this with more precision. I'm sure Mary Sue would tell you the same. Um, it, all your presidents will, that, that the, the, your great universities are preparing young people very well for life, but folks now are beginning to say, show me, because well, not everybody is. And then, of course, the other side of that, in my wise guy mode, I give a slideshow sometimes. I get to the end, I say, now, you're going to want to write this down. It's a complex equation I have for you. And of course, what it says is quality equals, uh, or value equals quality over cost. Um, a, a higher ed has assumed that everyone would buy the quality, believe in the quality, and has been a little too casual sometimes about the cost. And so we have to work on both ends. Well, a cynic or a critic would say, isn't this a slick piece of sleight of hand of, the, of higher ed? You can no longer prove to me that this degree makes me more money, so you're going to change the measurement of what success is in my life. Well, that'd be, you know, Lily Tomlin used to say, no matter, no matter how cynical I get, I can't keep up. <laughs> you're not one of those, are you, Devin? No, no yeah. not at all. Yeah. Uh, but, um, well, I mean, uh, Listen, there are some measurements out there that, I, and I hope we refine them, that go specifically to the so-called ROI. What did it cost you to get a given degree? What are you yeah. earning? Five yeah. and ten and twelve. Fine. That's part of it. I mean, the, what the Gallup people taught us was that's not all of it and that there are, if you really are, you know, remember uh, universities, especially land-grant schools like ours, schools like Michigan State and Purdue were put there in specific to by Abe Lincoln and, the, and, and his uh, colleagues to throw open the doors of higher education beyond the elites and to build citizens, not just people who, yes, people who will be productive, but also uh, uh, well-educated, thoughtful uh, contributors to our democracy. So uh, that's why uh, I liked what Gallup had to say. Um, I, I really learned that from them that, yeah, sure, um, financial, Security and success, they'll tell you, is the most important dimension. Don't have that, the rest tend to suffer. But it's not the whole of, of a well-lived life. Well, the other thing you found, and I'll to leave my flirtation with cynicism and get back on board with you, um, the, uh, you also found that what you spend on, on, on higher education 
uh, we always have the saying that you get what you pay for. Not necessarily. The more people spent didn't necess wasn't necessarily getting them yeah. better education. No, that's right. I, um, I, I've sometimes said to uh, business audiences, now here's a business you want to be in. Um, uh, nobody's measuring the quality of, of what you do, and the more you charge, the more people assume it must be better. Right? There's not only no elasticity, you're not losing customers till recently when you raise your price, but if the sticker price is higher, oh, must mean something better is going on. I said, who gets to operate like this? My wife said, Tiffany's. <laughs> I said, okay, there's one, but <laughs> that's about it. So, um, yeah, but, but that's all changing, and, and, uh, and I think high time. And uh, so, uh, you know, at, at Purdue, um, we, f we froze tuition after 36 straight years of increases. We froze it last year my, at my request to the board. It'll be frozen next year, and it'll be frozen the year after that. I don't know how far we can go with it. Three straight years of being frozen, yeah. I like to think of it that my classmates, the young people who were entering when I got there, will never, if they graduate in four years, will we'll never see a, a tuition increase. And we've reduced the cost of food and room and board and some other things too. We're, not, we're still not a cheap place to go, but I, we're, we're, we're taken seriously. I mean, I think, I, I think every university should, but certainly those of us who are land grants with that assignment have to take seriously the job of being accessible and affordable to young people um, of whatever income level who, who can uh, meet our standards. And um, um, I, I happen to believe, by the way, that it'll work out fine from a marketing standpoint. That is to say that uh, you know, last year, the highest percentage ever, by far, of, of entering freshmen reported that they chose a school other than their first choice that accepted them. They went to their second or, I don't know, maybe third choice. Why? Almost always the issue was cost. And um, so I do believe that uh, in the era we've entered, students and their families will be a lot more discerning and uh, will not necessarily assume that more expensive means better. Well, I would ask for a show of hands in here, but I don't want to turn it into a cry fest. But I know that we got, I, I talk to them all the time, parents who have done everything they have to to try and get their, a, a college degree for their child uh, at great cost, maybe to the child as well, coming out with a ton of debt. They arrive after graduation and there's no job waiting there. Yeah. W what has to adjust? The way we're preparing our kids, colleges, or is, our, uh, is it the backslide of the economy where all of a sudden we find 35-year-olds working at Starbucks taking the jobs that used to be taken by younger people? I think the first, the first cause is a, a nearly stagnant economy and this, uh, this sadly uh, weak, uh, weakest ever, really, weakest ever recovery from a, a recession, uh, especially a deep one like this. So that's the first thing. Yeah. But uh, no, um, it, it, the criticism is is true at least too many places. I hasten to say I'm sure it's not a, uh, any of your great universities here, but in too many places that uh, the students have uh, not been uh, uh, studying um, uh, the this, this sort of subjects that are likely to prepare them well for careers or life, that there hasn't been a lot of rigor. Uh, I proudly tell the entering students at Purdue, if you look at the data on what's called grade inflation, the average grade over time been drifting up and up and up. There's some well-known schools, if you look at those charts, you ask, you know, like, what do you have to do to get a B? You know, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, uh, but I point out to them that we have sat out that trend and we're, we're going to continue to so that the world knows that there was, that if you graduate from our university with a, with, with good marks that you, yep. you learned yep. something while you did it. Uh, we're out of time, but I gotta, I gotta get to one last question because this is a Big Ten room. Um, what happens... I told you football was out of bounds. Right, yeah, well, but, but well, what happens though if uh, what, what we watch happen here at Northwestern, what happens if college athletes unionize? I don't know. Um, I don't happen to think it's a good idea, but I understand what, what uh, animated it, and it's, uh, I think it's a, si a symptom of, of uh, it's not the problem, it's a, it's a reflection of the problem. 
And, um, you know, I don't, there's probably not a state I can think of with a prouder athletic tradition than, than your universities have created here. And I don't want to, you know, upset anyone, but, um, you know, Division I athletics is out of control. It is, you don't have students, these are in too many cases, too many cases, uh, you have, uh, you, you don't have genuine student athletes. These one and done situations, I think, make a mockery of the whole idea. Yeah. Um, and um, so uh, I, I wish I knew, I don't claim to know, I'm studying it, what the right way forward is, or maybe it's the right way backward to, yeah. to a better place. I'll just, I'll just tell you quickly that this is something I thought a lot about before I decided to accept the job. I'm, um, because it's, it's not a trivial matter. Um, we've seen proud institutions with recently with incredible scandals, um, lying and cheating and hypocrisy. And of course the money, the excesses of money are almost beyond comprehension. And so when I, when, when I was first asked this and ever since at our school, I said, listen, here's, here's the deal. First of all, I'm probably the biggest sports fan to ever hold my current job. Um, second, though, I, I think there are three things above the line. Never embarrass the university, so you have to have the same high standards of conduct for the you know, star tailback that you do for any other student on campus. Mm -hmm. um, second, um, student athlete has to mean it. So real students taking real courses, getting honest grades. And the third thing is pay for yourself. Don't ask us to raise tuition on some low-income kid from Lagodi, Indiana, uh, so we can have the sixth set of uniforms for the football team. Yeah, yeah. And now Purdue's doing those three things, in my opinion. And I said, now, after those, after those three things, I really want to win. You know, <laughs> like I'll be there, and I, you know, I'd go, and I'm in, I'm into it. I want to win everything. <laughs> I want to beat you guys every, in every sport. But. But, you know, if we're winning and, and, and those three conditions are not being fulfilled, then I would not feel, uh, I would not feel uh, uh, right. So that, that's what I think. As to what the, uh, should happen, I, I'm so glad to see that, you know, our, our Mary Sue and other uh, Big Ten leaders are getting us together to talk about this. And, and I, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are, there are some steps that can and will be taken to, um, so we can all continue to enjoy the, all the tremendous uh, um, not just entertainment, but sense of, uh, of a community that's yeah. hard to come by yeah. these days. Yeah. That, that college athletics properly done brings us without the, uh, what I think are uh, unfortunate embarrassments that have come with it too, late, uh, too often lately. Well, that was really candid and I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, former governor of the state of Indiana, <laughs> president of Purdue University, Mitch Daniels.